Dr. Stephen Greer is founder of the Disclosure Project, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or CSETI, and the Orion Project and Sirius Technology Advanced Research. He is father of the Disclosure Movement. He presided over the groundbreaking National Press Club Disclosure event back in May of 2001, where he had over 20 military, government, intelligent, and corporate witnesses presenting compelling testimony regarding the existence of extraterrestrial life forms visiting the planet and the reverse engineering of the energy and propulsion systems of these craft. Over 1 billion people heard of the press conference through the original webcast and on other media coverage such as BBC, CNN, CNN Worldwide, Voice of America, Chinese media, and other media outlets throughout Latin America. The webcast itself had over 250,000 people waiting online, which was the largest webcast in the history of the National Press Club at that time. He is a lifetime member of Alpha Omega Alpha, the nation's most prestigious medical honor society, and Dr. Greer has now retired as an emergency physician to work with CSETI full-time, as well as the Disclosure Project and the Orion Project. And during part of his career, he was chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Coldwell Memorial Hospital in North Carolina, and he is the author of four insightful books, multiple DVDs on the UFO ET subject. He teaches groups throughout the world how to make peaceful contact with extraterrestrial civilizations and continues to research, bringing truly alternative energy sources out to the public. He has studied the Sanskrit Vedas extensively and has been teaching mantra meditation for over 30 years. And Dr. Greer recently has been the subject of a historic film that has just been released called Sirius, which premiered on April 22nd. And I just want to let all of you guys know listening that I had the wonderful opportunity to be there in person to witness the event. And I have to say, honestly, that it was one of the most wonderful things I've participated in in a rather long time. And personally, it was one of these kind of things where you're there and you're exposed to the energy of the people and the the whole excitement of the event, of course. But I have to say that while I was watching the film, I just kept sitting there going, yes, this is actually what really just needed to happen right now. And I just kept getting the affirmation over and over again that this was such an important event and that it was going to be a moment of drastic change for, con- you know, for consciousness, for, for everybody, no matter what your level of understanding in all of these topics are. This film itself opens up a rather large question in one's mind that just begs you to really go out and seek answers to, to just know more. And I think that's just what's so wonderful about this. After I was done watching the movie, you know, I was there in LA for two days. I was able to just really connect with some good friends out there. And I brought some friends of mine to the, to the premiere and it was overall one of the most positive. I was just lit up after watching this. And that's what I hope to share with all of you having Steven on the show to talk and to share. And it was really wonderful to see his emotional and personal connection, not only introducing the film itself, but also sharing, uh, you know, his story in the film. Um, so I'm really excited to share him with all of you tonight. And we have a good show ahead of us. And he's going to be talking about some of the, the things, the technical stuff, yes, and, and where everything is going. But I'm hoping he'll share a little more from his heart about his personal journey, about where this has all taken him and the whole event on a positive level. So sit back, sit tight. But I just want to let you guys know his website while you're listening, if you'd like to, to check it out. It's SeriousDisclosure.com, SeriousDisclosure.com slash evidence. Those links are on my Achieve Radio homepage right here. And I have also purchased a, a uh, group of guest viewing passes. It's posted on my Facebook page. It's limited to the first five people. You can go on there. You can view the film for free. And uh, it, once the five are done, that's it, sold out. And you can find out the information on how to rent the film at the websites. So I just want to get that out of the way and I'll reiterate that throughout the hour. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on your show again. So where are we now? I mean, all of this exciting stuff has happened and, and you've released this film. I mean, what, what does this mean for yourself? Where, where are you with all of this excitement and attention that's happened? Oh, well, I mean, you know, it's been a really intense year because um, contrary to what some people think, this was a crowdfunded film. One thing uh, that I want to point out is that it was the most successful and uh, largest crowdfunded uh, documentary in history, not just in the history of the genre, but in the history of Hollywood or filmmaking and, and uh, thousands of people 
contributed so it could be made. And we basically did a, you know, five to six million dollar production for one tenth of that. And in one year from the moment of launch of the fundraising campaign to it being released, it was literally uh, less than one year, in fact, and and so it, it was. A, it's been a really intense year, but also very gratifying just to see the number of people who understand what this means. And uh, one, the purpose of the film actually was to raise awareness on the entire subject involving higher states of consciousness and contact, but also what's behind the secrecy around UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence, which has, which has to do, of course, with the science and technology part of it, uh, but. It was also done from the moment it was conceived as a means of raising the funds so that we could do a private, um, non-governmental uh, research and development project to bring these technologies out. Because having dealt with this subject for over 20 years, uh, what I have discovered is that most of the inventors become so paranoid that they don't ever get their technology out. And if they start to move it out, it gets confiscated. The government is not going to allow these technologies out that are going to terminate the oil industry. And the large corporations are so horizontally and vertically integrated into the system, uh, most of them will be forced to back off if they find a discovery like this. So it's going to take we, the people, as it were, to do an open source research and development e effort to bring the science and technology out. And, and I, I point out to folks that, you know, maybe in the early days in the 40s and 50s, um, the national security folks were concerned about what people would think if, if they discovered we weren't alone in the universe. But now about two thirds of the public believe that we're not alone in the universe. And the secrecy, uh, you know, is really because of just the momentum of, of how classified projects operate, but also because the Modus operandi, as a famous uh, top secret document from Canada stated, of how these objects move, what their energy and propulsion systems are, uh, was figured out. And by 1954, October 1954, we knew how these operated. And so for the last 60 years, we've been basically destroying Gaia and impoverishing the majority of humans on this planet, more than half live in poverty. Of unnecessarily, and I think this is, becomes a, a, a matter of, of great urgency. Uh, and so the film has really been uh, created for two purposes. One is to raise awareness, and the other is to raise the resources needed to do a proper research and development effort, because uh, we have found that you're not going to do this out of the back of your car. You're going to need to have a properly equipped lab with some really good physicists and scientists there doing it. So that's that's one of the real intentions, and the, and the, the net proceeds of what we're doing with this film are going into a fund to do exactly that. And so far, just in the last four weeks or so, we've raised about a quarter of a million dollars, which is a good start on the way to eight million. But you know, we're not there, but we're getting there. Well, I think it's very exciting, and I contributed financially to the film. And I remember when it first came out because I'm a member of the local CSETI group here with Maryland. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so, and I've also attended your expedition in 2010 at Mount Shasta. So I've always been watching, and I've just been, you know, signed up on everything and, and watching what you guys send through. And uh, I remember when the announcement came through how excited the local CSETI group was, and, and when we talked about it, and when we got together in, uh, you know, to gather how positive it was and how exciting it was and how we all just focused our prayer energy really to just make sure we held that space so that this could really manifest. So all of us were working really hard to do that and, and setting our intention and, and, you know, focusing our consciousness on the, on the positive aspect of this happening. And when we heard who you were having produce it, it was very exciting for us. And then of course we heard the, the bad news about his father being shot in the shootings at the Sheikh temple. And, you know, we were, we were worried about that affecting the project. And, and I was so proud that he persevered and, and moved through that and continued on with the project and how fast this manifested. And I used to write screenplays and I used to be a writer for Hollywood films and stuff. And one of the things that I know for a fact is that it takes an incredible amount of time to produce these things from that kind of level. So it was really impressive that it got done so quickly and it oh, was yeah. so well done. Um, so we were cheering you on the whole time and we were waiting oh, and we were hoping you. and keeping our fingers crossed because, you know, a lot of people have great intentions to go out and do this, but they just don't do it. And what I have found and, and what I admire about you, Stephen, is that you do it at such an impeccable level and you're so impeccable with your work and how you go out in the world and you really present it. You don't just do anything, you know, half-assed. It's always pulled together and it's always done very well. And I just really appreciate that. Um, so, 
when people talk about this project and now the film's out and now everybody's kind of, you know, all their feathers are ruffled and people are, are, you know, critiquing it and going through it and, you know, just really, I guess, you know, having some expectations with the film itself and, and maybe thinking that what was supposed to happen was the actual disclosure event itself, like they would maybe have with the government itself. I find that hilarious. Well, let me stop you right there. I was asked uh, recently, um, I believe I was on um, uh, the Joe Rogan show and he asked this. I said, look, Joe, here's the truth. Disclosure is being done by us. It's being done by we, the people. It is not going to be done by the president of the United States. And something that's a very chilling story that doesn't quite come out in the film. And a lot of people say, well, the film doesn't go far enough. Other people feel it goes too far. And frankly, I didn't create the film. I, I, I was the, the subject of the film and sort of the, the concepts. But the filmmaker who knew nothing about the subject was approaching it from someone who knows nothing. So it wasn't made for the aficionados of the UFO subculture. It was made for people who know nothing um, about the subject and to sort of open a portal to them. And then if you go to our website, uh, uh, Sirius Disclosure, Sirius like the Star System or, or Radio Network, S-I-R-I-U-S, Disclosure.com, there's a whole area called Evidence where we're uploading all these top secret military witnesses and all the documents and all the photos and images and all the reports on this little Atacama humanoid that... Uh, was pronounced to be a deformed human erroneously and prematurely. We'll get into that in a moment. But th- the fact is, what I, what I've discovered is that it's, it's, we really want it to be something that isn't preaching to the choir, but that introduces the subject to people who are curious and wanting to discover and explore more. And that was the purpose of it. And, um, and, and it's actually had that effect. I mean, you know, the Huffington Post had a very large article about it that had, over 4 million uh, viewers and uh, readers uh, of the article. In fact, it was the number one story on the Huffington Post for four days. And um, so it's it's one of these things for a small crowdfunded documentary. It's had an enormous impact already in the first month. And we're just now beginning to talk to people about having, you know, theatrical showings. Um, I, I want to mention those are the people who are in the greater New York area. It was going to be at the Quad uh, in, in Greenwich Village on West 13th Street starting Friday, the 31st of May for a week. And you can go to um, quadcinema.com and see what the showtimes are. So if you want to see it on the big screen, there's going to be a whole week run there. And also in Los Angeles in uh, Beverly Hills at the Music Hall 3. And you can go to uh, Lamley, L-A-E-M-M-L-E.com. It's a strange name, L-A-E-M-M-L-E.com. <laughs> and uh, you can find out when the show times and all that are. And it's going to be a whole week also in Los Angeles from the 31st of May until the 6th of uh, June. So what we're trying to do is introduce it to the public bit by bit. And, and I think that uh, for most people, they uh, come away from it with the concept that well, there really is something here. What do we do next? And uh, the, the disclosure movement is something that is actually being done by the people because uh, the, the, the people in, in, in governmental circles, there are those who know and those who don't know. And the those who don't know are most of the people we elect and appoint. Uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, and the, those who are you know, on the inside are the permanent bureaucracy, the so-called deep state, the national security state that kind of stays there. And um, I know that I never forget when I was briefing uh, President Clinton, the CIA director, about this. And he said uh, at the end of the meeting, it was almost a three-hour meeting, um, which he later tried to cover up. But luckily, I had the proof that it actually took place. And um, our James Woolsey said at the end, I was giving him this white paper that's in, in my first book, uh, that, is that you can get on our website, but it, it basically was recommending a certain number of action points for the president and, and him to, to do to get this subject out into the public and to get the, the science and technology out uh, so we could get off oil and, and get the, the, the whole world turned around toward the direction it should have been on in the last hundred years. And, and he looked at me, he says, how do we, and this is the CIA director, the sitting CIA director, not a former one, he says, how do we disclose that which we have no access to? Mm. And it was, you I mean, think about this. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, in my mid thirties. I'm an emergency doctor. I go up there as a sort of just a service project that I'm doing as a nonprofit to brief a sitting CIA director on this. And, uh, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And yet he was so emotional about it. I knew that he was not, uh, 
prevaricating. It, there, there was no question in my mind that he was speaking the truth. And I later found out that the same had happened to President Clinton when he was making inquiries and, and to many of the leaders. And so when people say, oh, when is the government going to do disclosure? I said, well, unfortunately, the government couldn't find its ass in a well-lighted room with both hands, and and for the most part, and and what we, to be quite blunt, and 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 so what we have to do is say, okay, the folks who do have this information, documents, testimony, information, need to come forward and tell the truth to the public, and then we need to tell it mind to mind, heart to heart about the fact that we are being visited, that these civilizations are completely non-hostile. That we, they're waiting for us to become civilized and peaceful. And they're also waiting for us to, to quit, uh, destroying the planet and each other, uh, over these ridiculous power struggles that have been going on for thousands of years. So, so that, you know, the problem is the, the ball is in our court. And one of the things that I always point out to people, let's not become cosmically codependent. Big government isn't going to fix this. Big corporation isn't, and and the ETs aren't going to land on the White House lawn, as as, as Larry King famously asked me years ago, uh, and, and just make it happen. We have to educate ourselves and actuate this, and that's really the message of the film. Um, and that's something that most people they kind of don't like that message because most people want to sit back and just be entertained with shock and drivel. They don't want to say we're actually the stewards. Of Earth, we're the children of Earth. We're responsible for the next five hundred thousand years of conscious evolution and enlightened civilization on this planet. We're responsible for bringing these technologies out, no matter how difficult the headwinds may be, and they are. Uh, we're responsible for going out and forming ambassador teams to make contact. And I point out to folks that we now have for Android and uh, iPhones a, a contact app that you can link to from our website, SeriousDisclosure.com, where for the price of a, a latte or a deli sandwich, you can download hours and hours of videotape, meditation CDs, mantra instruction courses, the whole techniques. And you don't have to come out with me in the desert, although some people like doing that. But it's there for anyone to have. And um, we have a great guy who developed that for us a couple years ago. And, and for the first couple years, it was only for iPhones. And now we have it for Androids also. So if you don't have an iPhone, you can do it also. And uh, it's just become a wonderful thing. We now have thousands of people all over the world who have teams that go out and use these techniques to make contact. And that in and of itself creates this morphogenic field shift, as Rupert Sheldrake talks about in consciousness, so that it paves the way for a good future to unfold around us. And that's really the purpose of, of why I left medicine to do this. I left you know, I, I often joke that, you know, I'm an emergency physician, and I know an emergency when I see one. And, and <laughs> our planet is in a very dire emergency, and we have to have people who are going to be healers and are going to join together to fix these very large problems that are actually imminently fixable. Right? And, and this is where I'm very optimistic. But it will only be fixable if we don't look to – big government to fix it or big corporations to fix it or big whatever. It's the people coming together. And that's how all real change in human history has happened. If you study, it's always, it hasn't come from the power centers. It's come from the people gathering together and creating momentum that changes the course of history. And that's really what we need to realize is we can do that. Stephen, do you find that you've had an ability all your life to see uh, things that aren't necessarily, you know, real time happening, that you've had an intuitive connection to the other dimensional aspects of, of what really enhances the, the, the true contact experience. And that's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, do you feel that the reason it's so difficult in the UFO ET subculture to really break through some pe to some people is that the lack of consciousness, the lack of understanding of that world or dimension you know, kind of holds people back on a level? Yes, and yes. I mean, you know, um, if you, in my, I sort of have an autobiography that's titled Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, and um, I think it's in eight or nine languages now around the world. Um, and also you can get that at the website, seriousdisclosure.com. And in it, I sort of describe when I was 17, I, I died. I was very sick and had a near-death experience. And 
I was raised a very um, devout uh, atheist, <laughs> and I was taught, you know, if it didn't, you can't measure in a test tube, it doesn't exist, period. So this experience, what I had was, since I didn't have the bias of organized religion, I had an experience of just unity consciousness and cosmic consciousness in this near-death experience. And it really did change my life. And after that, now, before that, I had had experiences of lucid dreams and intuition and all these sorts of things, but it really increased. And I said, God, I've got to figure out what happened and if I can keep doing this. So I learned Sanskrit and Sanskrit meditation when I, on my 18th birthday, believe it or not, I hate to admit this, for 40 years ago, because I'm going to be 58 on June 28th. But um, so what happened was I, I realized that this is something you can actually do. And so as I began to practice the meditation techniques, which by the way are in this app that people can get um, uh, for your iPhones and, and Android, we I learned that these interstellar extraterrestrial civilizations, their communication systems are all phasing at, if we, we can call it that, resonant frequencies that are beyond the speed of light that cross into these other dimensions of so-called visual thought, astral consciousness, thought energy, because they're not using electromagnetic signals to travel across time. And one of the biggest problems I have found with people who studied the UFO issue is that they confuse the things being made by Lockheed Martin and my uncle's old company, Northrop Grumman. My uncle designed the, the lunar module, put the first man on the moon. And... They confuse these things that are, quote, flying saucers that are man-made, that have rivets and seams, with the actual interstellar vehicles, which are really amazing. Uh, and they can fully materialize in 3D space-time, but often they can be hovering in your field and just appear as a sphere or an energy field or a vibratory distortion in the atmosphere. And one of the things I try to teach people is to dis have discernment between uh, what it is that classified programs have and what it is that are interstellar and how they overlap and what the distinction is. But the big distinction is understanding that if they are interstellar and they're here, a priori, and by definition, they must be transdimensional or interdimensional. They have to drop out of linear 3D space or 4D space-time and reappeared another point in space time using very high voltage systems, which we understand. And I know people in, who've donated stuff for various three letter agencies who've reproduced this effect. And they basically teleport the entire craft and everyone on it from point A to B. But the other thing people have to understand, they can be in our atmosphere or hovering over you and not in 3D space time, but in an energy form that is very, very close to what you experience when you're having a lucid flying dream or an out-of-body experience in a so-called astral body. Why? Because it has shifted beyond the crossing point or the speed of light into these other dimensions. And so there is absolutely the no way to understand the actual extraterrestrial interstellar presence without understanding the book of our own souls and the, and, and the nature of our own consciousness. And that, to me, is what is most exciting about this whole subject, is that it opens a vector into not only discovering outer space, but more importantly, inner space. And the two come together on this subject in a really elegant way, if, if you understand it. Yeah, and the remote viewing that you work with in your expeditions too, is that, is that part of all of that? I mean, I feel it is very strongly, but for other people who may not have ever worked with you or understand now the remote viewing aspect, do you feel that that's really the key to being able to access those willingly and lucidly? The real key is understanding the nature of consciousness and mind. And as Erwin Schrodinger said, the total number of minds in the universe is one. That is, mind is a singularity. And this has now actually been proven in, in various studies by scientists, including the peer lab that Dr. John ran at Princeton, and I knew Dr. John. And, and uh, what you find if you look into this subject with any, any depth is that it has been known for a long time that consciousness, uh, even though we identify it with our ego and individuality, there's an aspect of it that is, shall we call, transpersonal, that's transcendental, that is omnipresent. And if you can go into a quiet meditative state, which is what I teach people to do, 
you can open up into this aspect of mind that is omnipresent. It's everywhere, which means that you can see what's going on on the dark side of the moon, if you wish, or if you want to see something going on uh, into the future or the past, knowing, of course, that if you're looking into the future, it's a probable future, not a definite future, because everything we do and say in the now alters the, the uh, unfolding of the future. And so this is why you have to be careful with that. But when you're remote viewing a distant place, you can do that. So you can contact ET civilizations through this faculty. And then what we do after we remote view yeah, it's really three steps. First, you go into deep meditation. Then you open in, into this, this aspect of consciousness that's, quote, non-local, as Dr. Larry Dossi described it, non-local mind. And at that point, you, it's a discipline to very subtly intend to know or see something that may be at a, at a remote distance or hidden beyond the speed of light. And then once you see it, if it's an extraterrestrial spacecraft or planet or person, the next step and this is the third and critical one, is to then vector or send an image of exactly where you are. So you send a sort of holographic visual image of where you are. Say you're sitting in upstate New York with your, your friends there, Marilyn and, and Diane and all, and you show them where you are coming in from space or wherever you feel they are and vector them as you would a jet into JFK Airport, but you vector them straight in. And the reason our teams have had so much success with amazing contact and sightings and events is because all interstellar civilizations have not only consciousness developed to pick this up, but also very advanced electromagnetic technologies that interface with what I call coherent thought, this kind of clear thought coming from non-locality. Because it's sort of like coherent light. A laser is coherent light where all the wavelengths, the green wavelength, it's all synced up, and that's why you have a green laser. This is thought linked up into this coherent field of consciousness and this field of unbounded mind. And for people to what the what, the reason I like taking people out for these week long expeditions is that they have these big breakthroughs over the course of the week with this um, if they practice it and then events begin to happen all around us that are quite unusual um, and many people are surprised because there'll be stranger things than if the mothership landed and you could kick the tires on it because ninety nine point nine percent of the time the actual extraterrestrial vehicles are not going to be in three d when they are it's quite spectacular. But often they'll be there in forms uh, that are more like a plasma energy, a field of energy, an electromagnetic signal, a standing wave tone that's almost like a, a, a crystalline sound that emerges in the forest all around us out of anomalous uh, sources, which we know are ET. All kinds of phenomenon that most people are not expecting. And I think the reason they're not expecting it is that they're living in, in lo they're locked into 3D understanding, but you cannot go from one star system to another locked into a 3D paradigm. You have to go into uh, 5D and 6D and 10D and 12D in a much higher dimensional understanding of not just what consciousness and mind is, but also the physics of it, the science. And there is a science to this, by the way. Um, and, and I think this is a, the really exciting part to me is that once we can bring out these new energy technologies, uh, just so we're off of the, the the grid and fossil fuels, the next step will be the anti-gravity systems. And then the next step past that will be the systems that deal with trans-dimensional communication uh, that, that is reproducible and has to do, and there is a definite science and physics behind it. But it kind of blows people's minds if I talk about it too much. But um, it, it's it, uh, exciting, but in the in in the real world, you can just practice it because the nice thing about it is that everything you need to make contact and understand this is folded within every person, and it it, re it reminds me of the old Sufi saying. Uh, it's a rhetorical question that says, "Think of thyself a puny form when within the the universe is folded." Literally, the entirety of the universe is folded within every single individual because of the nature of the quantum hologram of consciousness. And when you begin to understand that, not just intellectually, but begin to experience it and explore it, it it's amazing what opens up. 
you know, as you're talking and you're describing this so beautifully, it's really, it brings to mind uh, something that, you know, I work with the Native Americans. And one of the things that I've been privy to, which have, has been a powerful experience for me on so many levels, is the prophecies that they discuss about the fifth world time that we're in now and right. how the human body itself will become the time travel technology through consciousness. And that's part of the prophecies that they work with. Now, when they, they talk about star beings and they go way, way back, much further beyond Roswell and all of the, the traditional things that so many people hear about in the subculture itself. You right. know, they talk about it. They have these stories. They have the myths. They, it, it, to them, they've just been here forever. They're still here. They're still coming. And I'm just curious how how the indigenous, the Native American aspect has worked uh, for you and your work, and how you you know, if at all, if it's if it's somehow integrated into how you how you do this. Well, it's integrated because it's, it's part of who I am. Um, my father was half um, Cherokee. And, of course, the pejorative for that in the South where I grew up was a half-breed, and we had to keep it very secret because of racism. Uh, of course, what was even worse is that I had a black girlfriend in high school. Boy, if my grandmother had found that about, I would have been disowned. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I mean, well, this is in the 70s in the North mm. Carolina. So, but <laughs> so you know, my life has not been ordinary, I guess, in, that, in many ways, and that's one of them. But my... My instincts is always, even though I didn't have a direct connection, because my father had no connection to his mother's side of the family, most of whom had died, um, who were from the Cherokee, on the trail of tears that had survived the march out from North Carolina to Oklahoma, as you know. Um, but it was in my sensibility, and I, I, if I can use that word, it was in my soul. And... Um, so th there's th there's the Gaelic and, and, and Celtic part of me, and then there's this Native American part. And so the way that I actually found spirit was through nature. And I will honestly say that um, my most profound experiences as a young man and a boy uh, was, was being out in, in pure nature, in the wilderness, and having this experience and this deep love for uh, Mother Earth. And, and I felt it was a conscious being and there was something transcendent and beautiful and that is very Native American but it was something while I did wasn't tutored intellectually and I wasn't part of any tribe it was very much awake in my genome for some reason it was present and uh, it makes you wonder what's carried on that spiraling helix of DNA because this was something that certainly I didn't get it directly from either of my parents who were very humanistic, reductionist, atheistic, et cetera, and so on people. But it was there, and I sensed it at a very young age. And, and so I was kind of this, this nature boy that was absolutely enthralled and in love with the spirit of, of nature and earth and sky and stars from my youngest memories, actually, my very youngest memories. Well, when I was looking up on some stuff online, I had noticed in Wikipedia that it had mentioned that your one of your first ET experiences was around when you were eight years old. Is that correct? Yes, I was about eight or nine, and I was actually out with some boys in the neighborhood being the little urchins that we were. And um, it was a crystal clear sky, and I looked up, and there was this seamless, spherical uh, disk uh, that was hovering in the sky, and we all saw it. And I guess I was about eight or nine, so this would have been probably 1963 or 64, um, where most of your listeners were born. And, and it was fascinating. <laughs> and, you know, for me, you know, I knew immediately what it was. I felt immediately this connection to the occupants. And after that, I started having a series of really lucid dreams uh, with the beings. And, of course, I didn't understand it. I thought it was kind of, I was a little freaked out. Um, and but you know it, it became quite clear to me that um, we're never alone and we've never been alone. And of course, my parents just said, "Oh well, you know, <laughs> you didn't see, you just saw an airplane." Of course, it wasn't. It was silent. It was hovering. Mm -hmm. It was there, and then it dematerialized in a crystal clear sky. And and that ignited an interest inside me. And so I became. I hate to use the word obsessed, but I used to clandestinely collect, collect all every magazine and book I could about UFOs back in the 60s and hid them in the bottom of my closet. And I had a three-foot stack high. I don't think I've ever told this story <laughs> uh, of them. And I would pull them out, and I was in such love with the images and the concepts. 
And of course, I mean, I, I sort of outgrew that as my teenage years went on and, and then I went into medicine. But I never out, outgrew the love of it. It just sort of, you know, my obsession with it went as a child. Um, I was just absolutely fascinated with it. And, and so I, I knew that we weren't alone and it was something that I, I knew starting at about age eight. Interesting. I had the same exact experience, very similar when I was five. And I've talked about that before. My listeners have heard that story before, but it's, it's interesting. Um, the, the teenage years when you grew up, how did that, I know you said you kind of just grew out of it a little bit through that time frame. Did you, did, when you came back into it, that was your near death experience. Yeah. Yeah. After that happened about six months later, I was up on a mountain in North Carolina, um, and I was meditating at sunset. And just before I, I was going to into meditation, I saw the same spacecraft that I saw when I was eight uh, in the sky, uh, a clear sky. It was in October of 1973. And I just acknowledged them. I said, oh, they're back. And so I went into this deep meditation, and I had a samadhi experience, very much like the near-death experience I had. It was so profound. And uh, when I came out of this meditation, it, it had been at least an hour, and the, the stars were out above me, and, and it was stunning, and, and the Milky Way. And I looked up, and then I realized there was a, a little uh, ET on my right side that touched me on my right shoulder. And I had a ski jacket on, and I could actually see the jacket indent. I felt it. And at that instant, all of my hair, literally, it was like this electromagnetic charge. It was so amazing. And actually, all my hair stood on in, and that's when I had a lot of hair, um, uh, unlike now. And, and so <laughs> what happened was that there was then this, this snap in space-time, and I found myself with these beings on a craft, and that's when we co-created the CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Protocols. Um, and to be honest with you, I, 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 people say, what did you talk about? I said, no, it wasn't that. It was being together. It was very abstract, very trans-dimensional. Um, but it was for probably two or three hours. Um, and then when I came back, I had this strange um, anti-gravity field around me where I could go. It was like you see the moonwalkers where they leap and they sort of float a long way and come back down. It was like that. So coming down off this 5,500 foot mountain at midnight. I thought it was nine o'clock, but it wasn't. You, you know, I would make a, a, a step and I would go zing, bing, bing. I thought, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> it was almost like I was levitating. And by the time I got all the way back down to this little college town up in, uh, near Boone, North Carolina, um, I, I was kind of back to normal and the town was deserted. And I thought, oh my God, the Yom Kippur War was going on. I thought we've had a thermonuclear war. The town is deserted. <laughs> And it was actually midnight when I thought it was 9 o'clock at night, and uh, which normally the college town would be very busy. So it was this amazing experience. But from that, I began to experiment privately with these remote viewing techniques and meditation, the protocol of vectoring the craft in and using consciousness as the central communication system. And it was something that was the result of this contact experience I had uh, in 1973 up on that mountain. Um, that was very unplanned, I guess, in a sense, on my part. And I've often wondered, I think the thing that attracted these ET beings was that I was experiencing consciousness in a very innocent way. Um, after the near-death experience, when I learned meditation, I remember the first time I sat with my teacher, I had uh, a deep transcendent samadhi experience. He looked over at me afterwards. He says, you transcended, didn't you? And I just said, it was my 18th birthday, and I was... I didn't know any better. I said, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? I didn't know any better that you're supposed to make a big gishry about it and it's supposed to be so difficult and a big drama queen. You know, you have to lay on a bell of med, a, 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 be, a bed sky. of nails for 40 years and all this crap. And I, I, you know, I was just like, oh, okay. And, and what I tell people is that there's so much baggage associated with that. It's actually incredibly simple. Mm. It's just about being aware of the mind itself in its pure form. Very simple, and from there everything happens. So, um, so, so I think that the ETs were interested that there was this boy that had the interest in the ET issue and UFOs and that had this ability to experience consciousness that way. And I think because of that, I was actually sharing with these ETs what it was like to experience universal mind from the perspective of a human, so that there could be this development of a protocol for contact. And I didn't do anything with it for years, obviously. I didn't form 
CSETI till 1990, and this event happened in 1973. But in the intervening years, it was always with me in some way or another. It's interesting because when I first met you, I met you at Mount Shasta in person for the first time. And when I first saw you, I just kept getting pictures of you as a child. I could just see you as a kid and you just had the greatest, biggest smile on your face. It was really quite the image. And, you know, what I, what I, what I hope for people getting this kind of, you know, hearing you talk on these experiences and, and being able to connect with you, you know, as you speak from your heart about these topics growing up over time, this wasn't just something that you popped up one day and decided, Oh, I'm just going to go ahead and do this and make lots of money. And, and, you know, this was something that was <laughs> yeah. part no, of you know, I always laugh. <laughs> When people bring that up, I go, oh, yes, I'm going to leave a $550,000 a year as chairman of emergency medicine to do this crazy crap where my IRS returns a couple years ago was like $30,000. And, you know, like, are you kidding me? You know, the, it is a joke. You know, when people bring that up, I just laugh because, you know, my wife and I have, have literally foregone or put something on the order of seven or eight million dollars of our own earnings into this. And, you know, people think that there's any, I said, there is no funds to be had. And this is the biggest joke ever. But, you know, and people have all their conspiracy theories. Um, you know, because I had briefed CIA directors and head of defense intelligence agency and met with the Rockefellers. They think that somehow those folks are behind what we're doing. I go, yeah, right. Uh, I think not. And, <laughs> you know, we have well, really, mean, clearly we've, say we've, in we've really film. struggled. We've really yeah. struggled and we've really sacrificed. But, you know, it's something that I don't feel like, you know, I, that's not what this is about. Frankly, this isn't about me. And, and with all due respect, it's not about you. It's mm -hmm. about all of us together. It's about what humanity can become and must become if we're going to be around for the next 500,000 years. And, you know, the, 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 a few weeks before the, the, the National Press Club event in 2001, you know, I, it was a very stressful event. I had serious threats on my life. Uh, I had a, a very senior think tank guy who basically said, we're not going to let you do this and we're going to take you out. And so I did a retreat up near Joshua Tree National Park with some folks and we went into a cave that a member of our team knew about. And we went in there and this, we were in this deep meditation with about nine of us inside this, this dome shaped cave that had Native American etchings um, from a shaman on the, on the ceiling of it. And I thought as clear as I'm, Hearing you speak now said that the vision that must guide the world. And, and it was this vision of us going from the current state into this whole new era, this new yuga, uh, which is a 500,000 year cycle that we're entering, which, by the way, is a universal cycle, the hallmark of which is universal peace where humans are going to live on this planet peacefully, not for a short period and then fall back into war, but in an unbroken point of ascendancy from going forward for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, and, and where humans will become extraterrestrial to other planets. And this was so clear. I could see it as clear as walking around on my farm out here in Virginia today. And, and I think that that was something that was so wonderful because like, people say, what keeps you going? I said, it's that knowledge. It's that vision that, that we've had and that many people have had, not just myself, that, that, you know, we are at this, this tilt, tilting point, this change, this emergence of, uh, where we've been kind of stuck for uh, a few thousand years to where we must become. Uh, and that is a, uh, not just a world peace, which is, you know, I mean, world peace is just those 1890s. I want to vomit. Uh, yeah. it's got to be universal peace, you know, and, and the, yeah. the crackpots in the UFO subculture say, oh, well, there are the good ETs and the bad ETs. And yeah, I said, let me tell you, if you've got the ability to travel from one star system to another, if they were fed up with us, they'd take us out in one nanosecond and the earth would be a pink mist floating through space. Uh, in fact, I said that to the head of, uh, the Wright Patterson where the Roswell remains when I said, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, is that there, these civilizations of which there are many are waiting for us to quit being insane. And, and, uh, yeah, really. and, and you know, and, and, you know, it's funny because in the ER, when, you know, when people came in really schizophrenic crazy, you know, you had to commit them to, to mm. the mental ward and the criteria was, dangerous to yourself or others. And I used to think, God, that really defines the human race right now. We're dangerous to, to ourselves. And we're dangerous to others. And it's, the, it's, it's that dynamic that we have to change. And it isn't going to happen through, you know, saying, oh, we're going to go from the Cold War and global terrorism 
to a threat in outer space that we're going to have a, a coalition with the ETs that look like they came from Norway, which are our friends, and anyone else that looks different, we're going to go into a sort of an eschatological end of the world struggle, uh, which would only fan- fulfill the fantasies of the hardliners at Opus Day. I'm going, come on, folks. I mean, this is nuts. We've got to understand that the time we're in is a time where we have to make a complete break with that kind of thinking. And to do it, we're going to have to have uh, enlightened people everywhere being the ambassadors to these civilizations, the facilitators of disclosure, and the people who support bringing these technologies out so that we're not destroying Gaia and, and keeping most of the world impoverished and uh, unnecessarily. You know, and, and there's the old saying, without the justice, there can be no peace. And, and so long as you have half the world uh, impoverished and you have a petrofascist system that is destroying the, the biosphere, while uh, 48% of the population of Earth doesn't even have plumbing, uh, literally a pot to pee in. This is not a sustainable dynamic, and the way to change that is to bring out the science and technology part of this issue, which has been the central motivating purpose of the secrecy for over 60 years. And I think that's what most people don't understand, is that, you know, (laughs) one of the things that Lawrence Rockefeller did say to me, he said, well, you know, no aspect of life on Earth will be unchanged by the disclosure of this. And and I I said, yes, Lawrence, that's why it's secret. (laughs) Speaking of Rockefeller, (laughs) Stephen, I I just want you to, you know, use this moment to kind of, uh, you know, address the audience and just, you know, because I think what happens, especially in the alternative truth movement, the, the media, is people hear that name Rockefeller and they just kind of attach a bunch of negative associations to it um, for, for whatever reason. And so when they hear you say, and you do even say it in the film that, you know, you did meet with him. Do you think that there's a, a misconstrued idea about what your relationship is with him because of oh, that? Oh, well, I mean, people misconstrue everything, you know, I mean, and, you know, frankly, well, I won't say what I think about that here's what really happened you know i was in the process of putting together what was called project starlight which the clinton library has released those documents now to brief the president the ci director and stuff lawrence rockefeller who had had an interest of this for years and he was the philosopher king of the family it was his brother david doing chase manhattan bank who's part of this majestic group keeping the secret lawrence was was not part of that and he actually wanted to end the secrecy he was very supportive, but unfortunately, you know, he got painted with the same brush of, of all the Rockefellers, which, of course, were Standard Oil that became Exxon Mobil, blah, 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 blah. So I'm not saying there's no culpability in that clan, but Lawrence was, towards the end of his life, I can't speak to when he was younger, but when I knew him was really concerned about this, and he knew we were in trouble. So I was invited to New York and then to his ranch out in Wyoming to basically brief him and to share with him what we were doing. And so he was very supportive. And, uh, you know, I, some people called it the Rockefeller Initiative. Well, it wasn't. It was the Disclosure Initiative called Project Starlight back in the 90s that Rockefeller became aware of and became very interested in and was really encouraging President Clinton to end the secrecy on this. Now, I will tell you something I haven't said before. When I was with him privately, he said, I can only do so much with this. I need some people to do it because it's it's too dangerous for me. And I said, Lawrence, you're old, you're rich, and you're Rockefeller. I'm just a country doctor in North Carolina rambling around in an ER taking care of shootings and stabbings and car wrecks and heart attacks and stuff. And he said, no, 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 I can't. He said, there are, there are some members of my family, he didn't name them, already jumping up and down on my feet because I'm doing this much. So he, you know, as they say, you know, blood is thicker than water. He was under a lot of pressure not to do too much. Um, on the other hand, he really wanted someone to, to help do this. And this is the same line I got from a good friend of Bill Clinton's who came to my home after we provided all this material. He said, they're very supportive of what you're recommending, but they're convinced that if the president does this, he will end up like Jack Kennedy. And I started laughing. We were at, table, at dinner with my children, and I, started, I thought this was the silliest thing I ever heard of. And he stopped me. And he says, no, they're serious. They really don't. I said, well, what am I, chopped liver? And later we had a private <laughs> conversation and he said, yes, you're chopped, you're 
you're the expendable one. No one cares if they take you out. Uh, but they don't want to risk the presidency. And, and sort of, so Clinton he said this sort of the same thing that Rockefeller said, and that is there's a lot of heat on this subject. There are a lot of powerful interests that want to keep it secret. We don't want to stick our necks out too far ahead of the curve, but if you'll do it, that'd be great. So <laughs> I tell people the only currency that really matters in all of this is – your vision and your heart and your courage. Uh, you have to have a certain in- intellect to, to deal with the complexity of the issues, but the main thing are those things, and it, it's a very spiritual issue. And I think the thing coming back to this near-death experience, because after that I realized there was no death. And so when a former head of Army intelligence threatened me back in, in, back in the day, uh, I just turned to him and I said, I'm not afraid of death. So you can go pound salt in someone else's sandbox. And he just looked at me. And then he later came around and offered me and then my wife $2 billion access to a fund if I would shut up and and deal with this issue. I said, no, I'm not interested in your money. I said, I'm not rich, but I'm well off enough as a physician. I don't care about that. And they made every run at me you can imagine, threats, bribes, this, that. And, of course, now the Internet's full of all kinds of defaming, nonsensical things. And you just expect that. I mean, I, I, I'm at the point now where it's not that I'm so thick-skinned and it doesn't sting. It's just that you expect it, and it's been going on for 20 years, so why shouldn't it go on for 20 more? But the reality is you can't let those things affect what you're going to do if you know the truth about something like this because this is the pearl of great price. This is You don't return this one. This is about the human future and our future as a civilization and how we go forward as a people peacefully into space, but also how we live on the earth in, in, in peace with Gaia so we're not harming her and, and with justice for the people of the earth so we're not in poverty. All those issues come in around this subject. So it's so much more than, you know, are UFOs real and are ETs here? It's all these issues. And I think that once you understand what this is about, then you're going to go the distance on it, and and that's what I chose to do. I mean, to my own personal detriment, frankly. But um, I would have been much better. And I think my children, if you ask them, would be much happier if I just stayed a physician and, and living a quote normal life. But but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> Not oh now. well, you know, I tell people <laughs> normalcy is greatly overrated. You know, I mean, <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> I gave up on I that in sixth that. grade. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I said, how you, boring. You, One time someone said, oh, Dr. Greer, you seem so normal. I said, well, I've never been so insulted in my life. Anyway, I'm just joking. But... <laughs> sort of, right? <laughs> sort well, of. Well, you know, Stephen, do you think that the fear of death is part of what, you know, the, the current paradigm on this planet uses to keep people's consciousness suppressed? Because... No matter how I look at this topic, it always comes back to consciousness and it always comes back to, you know, the level of consciousness you're able to hold as a generator of frequency. I really believe that consciousness is a frequency that you generate. So when you are in fear, you know, you're generating fear and it's a frequency that goes out all around you, just like when you're in love. I mean, everybody knows what it's like to be in love, mostly, you know, and when you're in love with somebody, that frequency just generates powerful levels and it's a level of consciousness. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts are, because when you talk about death, there's, you know, the masses, the majority of people are very caught in this kind of net that keeps them in that fear of death so that they just kind of are like hamsters in hamster wheels. They just keep going round and round and round and don't even realize they're in a cage, let alone what's outside of the cage. Yeah, but I, I view that as a spiritual disease and not so much, uh, you know, I think there's a distinction between spirituality and religiosity, which are mostly inversely proportional. But um, <laughs> that's Greer's theorem, by the way. There's an inverse relationship between religiosity and spirituality. But I think that if you understand the nature of consciousness and mind and conscious evolution and higher states of consciousness, you can experience that without a near-death experience, frankly. And begin to realize that we are more than just a reductionist, a bunch of uh, 100 billion neurons firing, that we are this amazing mind and consciousness that is, uh, our individualities are an opening that is tied into and integrated all the time into that omnipresent great self, if you will. 
and the great spirit, as the Native people call it. And that is just the truth. And once you experience that, then you begin to have a, a more balanced approach to something that may be a threat. It isn't that I haven't been afraid at times, and it isn't that I'm reckless, I, but there's a difference between foolishness and, and bravery and courage. And I think that, you know, you begin to understand that, you know, there's a time for you to do certain things and to lean into certain things. And um, wisdom comes with that. And, and, and I've, I've not always been wise. I've had plenty of foolish moments in my life. But, uh, <laughs> I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, 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 and human, I actually right? delight in it. I'm actually, you know, sort of, <laughs> I'm a wild man. Anyone who really knows me is like, oh, boy, is this guy wild? I'm wilder than any of my children. So, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> much wilder. But the, the fact is, is that I'm sort of unrestrained. But the, the thing is, is that we we have this ability to experience this state of awareness Every day, all the time, and it's just a matter of intending to do that, and there are techniques that facilitate it, and that's what various meditative and prayer states will facilitate that, and once you experience that, then you're you're not going to just be in your physical body self where there is this um, fight-or-flight response in, in the midbrain that causes you to become so fearful, and that's where you find true spiritual courage and what's been called the Shambhala warrior, um, not in a violent way, but the courage to go move, to do the right thing. And, and I have to say, you know, I have a home in Washington and, and I meet with people all the time who are enormously powerful and frankly also enormously wealthy. And they are so afraid of taking on this issue because of fear of ridicule, for fear of reprisal, for fear of loss of their career, for fear, fear, fear. it's all based on fear. And so fear is the mind killer, and fear is the opposite of love. And I think that once you experience uh, a deeper state of yourself that is this conscious, transcendent reality, which is within every single person, like a quantum hologram that's omnipresent, then you can begin to free yourself of that trap, and it's a process. And and I think that's what spiritual development uh, does uh, result in. Uh, if it's genuine. Do you feel that if one of us breaks through, we all break through because we're all ultimately one mind? Well, I think it, it has an effect. Um, and this has been documented scientifically uh, that when a group of people experience that, it will affect the entire community and area. And so I think that the concepts that Rupert Sheldrake began to discuss in, in, in morphogenic fields and, and uh he and I've lectured at some of the same conferences, the Science of Consciousness Conference and others. What we find is that if you look at studies, that when a certain experience begins to be uh, manifest by a certain number of people, it non-locally begins to be experienced by people that aren't any direct connection. It's like the hunter's mm -hmm. monkey effect. And this has mm -hmm. been documented yeah. scientifically. So I think that, yes, it does, but not maybe as strongly. Uh, but it's like anyone who's been with someone who's a very powerful, conscious person. There is a certain, well, in the, in the East, they call it a darshan, uh, sort of an effect that you can feel from, from that person. Oh, yeah. And, I just recently had the opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama while he was oh, yeah. here in the States. And it, he's, and he's a perfect example of just what you just described is the, the fact that his, his mere presence can change people in the sense that he resonates this frequency that is profound and, and lifts and clears and just connects you to something that's very, very powerful. Uh, right. we're at, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to make oh. sure that we, we close with giving, I know it's gone by so fast. Um, we give everybody a chance to, to know where they can connect with you. What's your next training? I know everything's on your website, but if you want to just give a few seconds of, of you know, what's next for sure. people who want yeah, to decide well, to, to come up with you. Everything we're doing is at, uh, now integrated at uh, SiriusDisclosure.com. That's S-I-R-I-U-S, like the star system, Disclosure.com. And we are going to be uh, going to the United Kingdom uh, in the crop circles for a week in July, although that's already oversubscribed and full, but we'll be doing another event in the western United States. We haven't quite selected where. We were thinking about Chats, but I think we're going to find a place that's more private, uh, that we're going to all be at a retreat center surrounded by national forests. It's exciting, but we're just nailing that down. But information about that will be up on our website soon. 
And everyone who wants to see the film, Sirius, can see it now uh, on our website at SiriusDisclosure.com. You can see it video on demand, and um, you can also order the DVD. We're going to start uh, manufacturing those actually next week, and hopefully they'll start shipping out mid-June. So anyone who wants the DVD can do that. And and uh, also, if you want to see it on the big screen, because I think it's much more impactful if you can, it will be at the uh, Quad Cinema in New York uh, May 31st to June 6th, and then also there in Beverly Hills at the Music Hall 3, uh, and information about that is at uh, Lamley, A-L-A-E-M-M-L-E dot com. So that's sort of what's happening. And the main thing that I'm asking people to help us with is to contribute to the um, uh, STAR New Energy Fund, Serious Technology and Research. We have an entity to raise the funds to open a research and development lab to bring these uh uh, amazing new technologies out so we can get off oil and gas and coal and and uh, you can contribute and donate uh, any amount at seriousdisclosure.com and uh, any of the proceeds from the film uh, rental or purchase also goes to to supporting that effort so anything that any of you can do to do that would be great and in June we're going to start a, um, a program where people can uh, with, get the DVD and then host a star energy lab um, uh, screenings of fundraisers where you can do it for in your home or your unity church or your community center so we're going to start that as well so people can stay tuned and anyone who wants to can sign up on our website and um with your email address and, and we'll send you our newsletter with all this information as as it begins to break Excellent. And there's so much more, too. You do a radio show and all of that information and your blog and you're on Twitter. So there's so many ways people can connect with you and they can also find out the local C-City groups if they're interested as well. Stephen, thank you so much for being here.